This is a live recording of Slola Altadena's August 7th, 2021 meeting. Ann Quo discusses seed saving for melons, peppers, and cucumbers. Please enjoy. Stay tuned. Um, and, oh, we're always looking for new volunteers. So um, if that's something you're interested in doing and helping us out, uh, please email me. I'll put the email in the chat in just a minute. Um, but with that, I'm going to introduce our presenter. We have Ann Quo. She's the um, voice uh, behind the Real Hens of OC. That's her Instagram account. Um, she's a homesteader. Um, she and her husband grow a lot of their own food. Um, she's also a master food preserver, um, which I find really fascinating. <laughs> but she's she's joining us today to just talk about. Um, seed saving um, and any other wisdom that she might uh, have up her sleeve to share with us. So with that, I am going to turn it over to you, Anne. Thank you very much for having me. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Um, as Jessica mentioned, I do grow my own food and we grow, um, or at least we try to grow almost everything we eat that you would typically buy at a grocery store um, in terms of produce. Um, and part of that for me is because we believe in living as sustainably as possible and closing kind of the eco loop, sustainability loop. So I do do a lot of seed saving. Um, and today we're gonna talk a little bit about peppers. That's why, and saving peppers, that's why I'm in my kitchen because these are spicy peppers, some of them. And I didn't wanna do it in my, office and accidentally, you know, get peppers on my finger and then accidentally touch my eye or something then. <laughs> but um, so as far as peppers, generally like tomatoes and other um, than tomatoes, peppers tend to self pollinate. So there's less issues of cross pollination. However, if you want to save it to give to someone else besides yourself if you don't care about having hybrids because you know you very well could create a new species um, or a new plant but for saving seeds like um you know the seed library and um if you want something more pure in terms of seeds then you want to still space out your plants um, a little bit, um, you know, don't put them right next to each other, put in different parts of the yard, especially if let's say you have a rare plant that you are um, trying to save seeds for. Um, so for example, one I have here, it's not ripe yet. I have this, this is the Ethiopian brown berber. It's a rare plant. Um, well, when I say rare, I mean maybe to the United States rather, because you know a lot of plants come from other countries and we can't, and other cultures, so we can't discount the fact that it's not there, rare there, it's common, it's just rare here. So when I talk about rare, it's that. Um, so this is an Ethiopian brown berber, and I really want to save the seeds. So I planted it in a raised bed area in my front yard that's far from the other peppers that I have, um, because this is relatively um, difficult to find. Um, this is another one. This is a yellow rocoto pepper. There's red and different ones. This is also so called a Mazano pepper. And what's really cool about rocoto, for those of you who are practicing more kind of a regenerative style growing and um, permaculture style or whatever term you choose to use, this is a pepper that'll live about 10 years. And um, what really distinguishes it, and I'll cut it open in a second, is that, um, so I don't know if you can see this. Regular pepper seeds are kind of light and white. Rocoto pepper seeds are black. So um, that's one really cool distinction, distinction for the Rocoto peppers. Um, there you go, they're black. I'm dropping seeds all over my laptop. Um, so when you're picking peppers for seeds, what you want to do, like with a lot of plants that you pick for seeds, you wanna make sure they are at least mature. And um, you can dry them and then cut them up for the seeds. This is, uh, I forget which pepper. Oh, this is one of my Korean peppers and it's already dried and all I have to do is pop it open and I have seeds in here. Um, the thing about drying though is because some peppers like, I only have small peppers right now. So 
I don't have any big ones, but like the Brakoto, they're very thick walls. So you actually might get mold if you're trying to dry them. You can leave them on the plant to dry naturally um, through the sun. But if you're going to dry it indoors, when, if you have a pepper that's ripe, don't pick the green ones because the seeds will be immature. Example of a, a green one. This is a ahi mango, another red pepper. This is a ripe ahi mango. You want this one because then the seeds will be more mature and developed. This one probably has immature seeds. It might have one or two, um, but uh, you'll want one of these. But anyway, the Rakoto pepper has really thick walls. And to do that, if you're drying it after harvest, because if you want your plant to keep producing and have more energy to produce longer throughout the season, what I do is I just take a knife and slice it. I'm gonna try not to get the juices on me because this is a spicy pepper and I don't wanna to touch my face. But you just slice it open and you leave it to air dry. And you see that the seeds are black. That's re what's really cool about this pepper. And, um, or you can just scoop out the seeds now and dehydrate it uh, and dry the seeds and then use the pepper for your cooking or whatnot. Um, so that's that and you scrape it off. And the number one tip I have for seed saving is label. <laughs> so what I do when I'm, I, I really try not to waste. So even if I'm saving seeds, I don't throw away my plants or pepper. I try to save them while I'm cooking them. Um, and because, you know, we are urban, I'm not growing a giant farm. I don't have a lot of plants to save seeds from. So I only have like usually one or two plants, um, and, or towards the end of the season when I'm waiting for things to go to maturity. But anyway, while I'm cooking, I'll take out these little common saucers and dishes and put all my seeds in there because I'll remember. And, um, but then I, you know, I, I'm sure a lot of you could probably relate. You get busy and you forget. And then, so I ended up and I don't have space. My kitchen looks, is deceivingly looking like it's big, but it's actually really small and I don't have a lot of counter space. So I start stacking them. And then what happens when it's pepper season, tomato season, they're all stacked together and I forget what they are because I don't label them because I was busy. So I don't know what these seeds are that I'm showing you. The only one I can tell you is the ricotto pepper because my red ricotto um, ripened early and matured early. So, and the seeds are black. I don't know what these other seeds are. So I end up with some mystery seeds. So my biggest tip is don't do what I do, do what I say, label them first so you don't get confused. Um, I have certain good guesses because of the timing and I know what I might be growing, but you know, things get busy and you just forget. So um, I'm gonna move some of these seeds real quick. So this is my Korean pepper that I showed you. And again, the seeds are white. The um, thing that you wanna look for is all the peppers, because of their size and species, the seeds might be different sizes. I have one pepper that has seeds that's um, almost the size of a tiny like amaranth seed or quinoa seeds, really small. And this one, this Korean one, let's see if I can, if my fingers dampen my finger, have it stick on me. This one's a little bigger. Um, and you also want to make sure that it's not super, super flat. Pepper seeds are a little flatter, but they're not perfectly, you, know, you want to make sure it has hard edges. And then there's a little kind of like a seed head there, a like little, I forget what this is called, but at the tip, there's this thing there. You want to make sure that's developed. Um, so let me cut this one. This is a green um, ahi mango. Uh, Ahi peppers um, originated from Peru or South America area, South Central America. And let me show you this pepper. This is really spicy. So um, if I start screaming, I apologize ahead of time. I'm going to go wash my hands. Okay. So you can see here, I picked this one because it wasn't quite ripe. Just to show you, the seeds are not fully developed and you probably won't really good... Um, you won't get a lot of good viability or um, growth out of these if you do try to sow them. I do see one seed that is viable. These seeds are tiny, so it's a little hard to see. But if you look at the difference between this seed at the tip of my knife versus this one here at the, the ones towards the center, these are undeveloped and those won't grow. Uh, let me extract it from the core. 
Oh, and when you're dealing with peppers, especially if you have hot peppers, and if you're going to be processing a lot of seeds, which I did last year, or if you're making hot sauce, um, wear double gloves because like the double layers of food prep, because the, the if you're working with it for a long time, the oils can seep through them and your fingers will burn. Um, so if you're doing a lot of this and manipulating with your fingers, I highly recommend you wear at least two layers of gloves. Um, and be really careful. My nose is already itching a little bit from the um, aroma. So these seeds in here, there you go, are a little tiny and not as developed. And for better comparison, let me cut up this ripe ahi mango. The ahi mangoes actually have kind of a um, Swedish uh, sweet flavor, fruity flavor. Sweet as far as peppers go, not candy sweet, right? Um, and I can't exactly tell you what the exact flavor is because my heat tolerance isn't like super great where I'll stick this whole thing in my mouth or even a piece of it. I'll just lick my finger to taste the strength. My husband, Guy Human, if you follow me on Instagram, um, he'll pop, I, he's my pepper taster. And um, I let him taste the spiciness first before I put it into food. Um, and also, as far as spicy peppers go, your growing conditions can affect sometimes the flavor, just like a lot of vegetables and the spice level. Um, so here's these two at the heart of it. This one, the seeds are bigger and more mature. And it's easier to compare the same types. You don't want to compare different types because again, different species or different cultivars have different seeds. And this one definitely has the, the red, the more mature one definitely has um, more viable seeds. And what you want to do is there's a pith. So you want to remove the pith. And usually so that I don't touch it, I'll put it in the vessel like this, but label it, right? And then let it dry out. Then you can take off the pith and um, store it in an airtight jar. Pepper seeds store for about three years. It can go up to five, but peppers actually have um, lower viability than tomatoes. Um, so they don't store as long. Um, so if you've ever wondered some, why some pepper seeds don't germinate very well, it's because they have a shorter lifespan in terms of um, being able to maintain freshness and germinate than um, other nightshades like tomatoes or eggplants. Um, so um, I think it's a good idea probably when you save them and put them in your jars or envelopes or however you store your seeds, um, date it, right the year and the year of harvest um, because then you'll know how old they are and if instead of putting one seed per cell or one pot, you might wanna put 10, I don't know. So um, there's that. This is another really cool pepper I wanna show you. This is called Ahi Fantasy. It belongs in the Ahi Peruvian pepper family. I don't know what this tastes like. Um, this isn't even ripe. I don't even know what the final color is because I haven't done my research on this. I just trade it with a friend who grows a lot of peppers and um, it's putting out a lot of fruit. And for those of you who are a fan of peppers and especially hot peppers, the ahi groups of peppers grow really well in Southern California. Um, they take the heat well, um, they overwinter well. The ahi mango here that I showed you is from last year, it overwintered. Um, I have another one that I forgot to harvest, but it's a picking pepper that I've had for five years. Um, so, and these um, get pretty big. So nice fruity flavor and you can grow them in pots. Um, let me cut open the Ethiopian Berber pepper. This is supposed to have like a smoky pepper and when it ripens, um, it turns kind of like a brownish red. And for the long peppers, um, I like to, I guess do whatever your preference is, but I like to slice them down the middle like this, just like what I showed you with the rocoto. And then because this way I can open them like this. So this pepper has a lot of seeds in there that appear to be somewhat mature. Let's see, let me get it. But they're, they're, I don't think they are because they're still really soft. And I'm trying, I'm trying to get one to stick to my finger. And you can see at the tip there where it would start its sprout, it's not very developed. And I can tell because it's really too flat. 
Um, so I wouldn't be using the seeds from this brown, um, Ethiopian brown berber that hasn't matured yet because it's just, I don't think the viability would be that great. You can always try, you, you might get something out of it, but I would prefer that it's much more mature and um, ready to harvest. This smells really good. Um, so there's that. Okay, so here's the, another pepper. This is a mystery pepper, um, it volunteered, or it was one of <laughs> these mystery seeds that I forgot and I just put them down. Um, this one already dropped and it has some damage. I think a bug or something ate it. So it's kind of mold, it rotted. This is like really squishy and rotten. You can see, I can just peel like this, but it's not even completely ripe. So some of these seeds can actually be saved, um, but you don't know until you cut, cut them open. This one is a sweet pepper. Um, I know it's a sweet pepper cause I can smell it and I can taste it. Um, but I'm guessing this is one of my uh, Napoletana giallo peppers. I'm telling you that I don't speak Italian, um, but it's just small because it's in a uh, small area. I'm peeling it. So here's the, the head and the nub. You see this black part? That's where it was kind of moldy and stuff. So I would take that out, but I do see several somewhat more viable seeds like this. Um, you see this darker shadow versus this lighter one. These are the ones that are ripe or mature. These are more immature. And then this black one is the moldy stuff. Um, so you would just kind of wash them and um, you can you can sort them out if you want. But pepper seeds are relatively easy to um, save. You don't need to ferment them or anything. And in a moment, we'll talk about cucumbers. You do probably want to ferment these um, for cleaner seeds. You don't have to. So um, anyway, that's my pepper seed talk so far. If there are questions, we can answer them right now. That's, again, the rocoto and the difference between a regular pe pepper seed on my right finger. Okay. Uh, okay, uh, there are some questions in the chat. Um, I'll go ahead and I'll, I'll read them in order. Sure. Um, first, Amy's asking, do you find there are drying best practices, um, a dehydrator, countertop, Is there, what do you recommend? For seeds, I don't recommend a, a dehydrator. At least that's not my preference because you're applying extra heat to it that may be too hot or um, not appropriate for the seed. So I think there's more chances of messing up in a dehydrator. Um, I prefer to dry my seeds more naturally, either on, on a countertop or on a window ledge um, or just in a, a shaded area with good airflow. Anywhere with good airflow, you want the airflow because if you don't have airflow, that's when you get mold. Um, and again, if you want to dry the seeds as far as peppers whole, you can do that. Um, just make sure if you have a thicker walled pepper, you want to perforate it so that there is airflow and that it can dry. Yeah. But, <clears throat> um, how does one know when the seeds are mature, ready to harvest and not too mature? Is it, can they be over the hill? Um, as far as I'm aware, they can't be too mature as long as they're on the fruit, because if you think about the way nature works and naturally, if a bird doesn't eat it and it help you spread it, it will just dry on the vine or the plant and um, it'll fall down eventually and self germinate, um, given the correct conditions. So I don't think it can over mature. Um, it, so it's always best to harvest seeds from a more mature plant, a more mature fruit, if you will, and because you have better chances of having better seeds and more viable seeds in the efforts of saving because, and also I, I'm thinking it's time, right? Because if you're gonna spend the time trying to scrape out all the seeds and label them, dry them, pack them, you're, you want to use that wisely. So unless your plant is kind of sick um, and dying, I would use the more wait for the more mature fruits and let it sit on that. And I mentioned that because I have a huge issue as I'm sure a lot of Southern Californians this year with um, spider mites. 
Um, and they haven't affected my peppers, but um, they affect things like eggplants and tomatoes the most. And one of my pepper plants has um, these woolly mealy bugs, aphids on them. So for plants like that, or who suffered damage because critters kind of have dug it up and you really want to save the seeds from that plant before it dies. I will take seeds from a immature fruit, but I'll just try to take as much as possible and make a note that it was an immature fruit in case, you know, the next year when I go back into my seeds, I know I have to sow more just in case not all of them were mature. And you can kind of tell when they dry, depending on how thin or how thick it is. Um, but if you can't, just make a note of it and just sow more. And then you can you know, separate them if you want to, or um, just trim them back and prune them. Okay, we have another question from uh, Eileen wanting to know the best way to store seeds. Um, cool, dry place, not in the sun. Okay. Uh, Glass jars, envelopes, uh, paper, plastic. I used to do glass jars or whatever jars I can upcycle as long as it's a dry environment. Um, I, I don't use plastic baggies anymore. I, used to, but I don't unless I'm recycling them just because again, that's my personal decision for sustainability factors. And also, if you didn't completely dry your seeds, this has happened to me a few times, and you put them in a plastic zap baggie, um, it can mold and rot because it's trapped moisture. So I prefer to buy the craft um, coin envelopes, the small ones, and I put my seeds in those. Um, and then it's also easy to write. For big giant seeds, like giant pumpkin seeds, when they take up so much room and peas and fava beans, I'll just reuse um, uh, zip baggies or what I do when I'm drying them. Um, and if I don't have enough vessels, because when harvest seasons come, my entire dining table, counter, kitchen is covered in food and seeds. I put them in those brown sandwich bags and I label them um, just with a Sharpie because then there is airflow in those paper bags and then you're less likely to risk molding. And what I'll do is because I'll have several bags of seeds and I also wrap the bags, let's say you're saving carrot seeds, I'll wrap the bags and tie it with twine over a, a carrot head, flower head, and then you just cut it off um, once you feel like it's dry. And that also prevents the birds from, you know, taking your seeds. But anyway, when they're on the counter like that, and you're not sure if they've all completely dry, all you have to do is w walk by and shake each bag, like a little maracas, you know, and just <laughs> like a little musical. And then that's easy. And if you don't have time to put it away, or you have guests coming, you don't have like 10,000 dishes to put away, you can just scurry all the bags into a drawer or in a basket, um, and they still will be okay and labeled. So that's kind of my cheat way of doing some of that before I have time to sort them all. Totally makes sense. Okay, Victor wants to know, um, he's got two questions actually. One, can you grow peppers all year? And two, can you recommend a milder variety or varieties for him? Um, peppers do have a season. Um, in Southern California here where we're at, and most of us are in zone, if you're in East LA, you're in zone 10, uh, A or 10 B. Um, you can grow them year round. They can be grown perennially. However, they may not fruit year round. So if you want year round fruit on your peppers, I would suggest getting a few different types because they can fruit at different times of the year. Um, I've had my Rakoto peppers, which is also called Mazano, and this is that yellow one again, um, fruit in December and January, but it won't fruit as much as some others. Um, mine should be fruiting. I have a red one that should be really fruiting now, but the grasshoppers ate all my flowers, so it's kind of trying to come back. Um, so just have a few different types. Um, and in the our winter, um, which is December and January, you cut them back. I would cut the peppers back um, so that they can grow back or whenever they look done, depending on the plant. Certain plants you don't cut back in December. Um, so again, that depends on your different cultivars. Um, for milder types, um, I mean, lower Scoville units, you can get um, 
I mean, I wouldn't say these are super spicy, the ricotto, they're probably like a medium and I'm a bad judge of that again, because I don't have a severe heat tolerance, even though I love peppers. Um, your Korean peppers are pretty decent. Um, uh, there is one type that I really like um, called Lady Han. You can get that from Adaptive Seeds. And um, that one produces really well. And then there's also a good one called Xiong Yang peppers. I originally bought that plant from one of my favorite nurseries. If you ever go down south to Vista, go visit Pearson's Gardens. It's just a magical place. So I bought my pepper from there. Um, but then I later removed it and um, tried to repot it, but because the, it was too much of a shock, it died. Um, but that is a really good pepper. Um, it has really good flavor. It's not super spicy. It's prolific. If you're into fermenting and making kimchi and stuff, those are great peppers for that. Um, I do love my fruity ahi peppers, honestly, and they go really well here. Um, the ahi mango did start it fruiting last month or producing ripe fruit last month, towards the end of last month. So Ashley, I'm just reached over my counter. I just harvested all these yesterday, just walking by. Um, there's like more than 10 of them. Um, so they, they grow really well and they're tiny um, and impart a really good flavor. And what I would actually do if you don't take heat well, but even if you're interested in some of these hotter, um, medium to hot peppers, grow some non-spicy peppers. I just don't have any right now to demo other than my mystery pepper um, and then mix them together. One that I really, really like, and that's in my front yard right now is called Murasaki Purple. I like really weird looking peppers. It's a purple pepper. It's green first and then ripens to purple to almost black. Uh, another one that's kind of mildish but spicy is Chihuacle Negro. It's a Oaxacan pepper used to make um, for mole. Um, but Murasaki, for those of you who are pepper lovers and have a hard time growing large, like those traditional bells here in Southern California, because sometimes I feel like it's too hot for those peppers. Um, Murasaki is a good one. They're kind of tiny though. And then Corbachi and Shishitos, those are really fun peppers. Very, the, they have very, uh, the Murasakis have very strong pepper flavor. So a little goes a long way if you want that pepper smell, even though you can't like host a lot of plants on your property. Um, Corbachis are really thin, long peppers, Italian peppers. They get about maybe eight inches long. Um, so yeah. Hope that answers some of those, the questions on growing. Okay, there's a question here that Jessica needs to answer, which is uh, Greg wanting to know if most of these varieties are available at Flora. I just saw that come in. I was gonna quickly look at our catalog. Um, <laughs> Do you wanna circle around back to that question? Yeah, let me come back to that one um, so I could just kind of peruse our catalog and kind of glance and see what we've got. Okay, Janet, uh, I'm not sure exactly everything you're going to plan to you plan to cover today, and but Janet wants to know how to set, save uh, tomato seeds and cucumber seeds. Is that on okay. the agenda? I'm going to talk about cucumber next. Yeah, and then we can talk about tomatoes a little bit. Ashley, if you are Instagram, I have a little video on how to save um, and ferment tomato seeds. It's which, by the way, anybody who is on Instagram really should be following in. She has a wonderful feed. It's called Real Ends of OC. And it is food, it is chickens, and it is funny. Thank you. Yeah, we basically talk about my homesteading lifestyle, um, urban homesteading lifestyle with sustainability and just a little bit of, uh, of uh, social awareness, too. And um, for anyone wanting to raise chickens, this is my book. Um, but anyway, um, if we want, let's go ahead and talk in cucumbers. This is a small, weirdly shaped Armenian cucumber. Um, it came from my only one plant that's already been chewed by pill bugs and damaged by chickens and now spider mites are attacking it. So I left it as long as I could um, on the vine. Um, so let's cut into, I don't know what it's gonna look like. But again, just like your peppers, your, cuc your cucumbers more so than peppers. You wanna keep these and let them mature as much as possible before you harvest the seeds. And, cut it. oh yeah, so this is the inside of my cucumber. I can already tell I left it long enough um, because for this is a little slimy, but cucumber seeds, ah, it's gonna fall off. You want them to be fat, 
can you see the profile? It's a little fat. It's not like paper thin. Um, and this is a viable seed. And you can just rinse it and dry it on a towel or just put it in one of these, you know, your little sauce dishes. But again, please label, don't do what I do, do as I say. So I have a drawer here, I put them in one of these. Um, some of these cucumbers may have like, like your tomato seeds, there's this little glassy protection um, around the plant, or sorry, the seed. Um, you can choose to ferment them, um, but after you harvest, I'll, I'm trying to find an immature seed to um, show you, but while I do that, um, if you want to ferment them to make a cleaner seed, I don't think it really makes a difference because I've saved seeds with the goo on it and it's fine, but um, I think it's just personal preference. Um, you would put it in a dish, and if you don't want to pick them out, one, I'm doing this with my finger. If you don't want to pick them out one by one, you can actually um, slice them or use a spoon and scoop it out. Or I don't want to dirty up another utensil. I just, you can scoop out the middle. And in your dish, don't drop on my computer. Um, and then take out and squish it, squish the pulp. Let's see if I can change this. You can see it, but there we go. Um, squish the pulp, remove the pulp, move it, feed it to your chickens if you have chickens or um, compost. And then I would strain it and rinse it or just add water to let it ferment. And by fermenting, I mean, um, keep it covered. Oh God, I hope I don't drip this on my laptop. Um, like this, okay? and then let it sit for two or three days, it's gonna start smelling and you're going to get a little bit of fruit flies probably. Um, and then you'll get this white stuff on top. The white stuff is not mold. I've had people freak out thinking it's mold. It's not mold. When in fermentation, you, the white stuff is yeast. If it's not fuzzy, like green or black, it's, and it's white, it's called cam yeast. It's just naturally, occur, naturally occurring. All you do is pour it out and strain it, put it in a, uh, Strain it like this, pour it out, and clean it and dry it. And again, you want it to completely dry before you put it away in your seed saving vessel, whether it's a baggie, uh, envelope, or um, a jar. And let me show you the difference between an immature cucumber seed and a mature one. Let's hope it stays on my finger. All right. So this is a immature seed. You see how flat it is and just kind of sad. And then this one here is a little fatter, like it's eaten something in its belly. And this one, again, let me show you this one. Let's see in profile. I'm holding my fingers so they're about the same, but you can see it here. So you, you don't want this flat one, you want the fat one. And that is a good cucumber seed. Um, and I think, I would say they store about three years. I forgot um, exactly how long they can keep, but I would say three years. I've had some older ones that ha had germinated and um, some cucumber seeds are gonna be a little more um, like a water, look more like a watermelon seed than this one. This one's more oval, sorry. That just like totally fell on my keyboard. Um, so yeah. And, and you can get plenty of seeds from one cucumber. So if you're just doing it for yourself or for a seed swap, all you need is one. Um, or if you're kind of a seed hoarder like me, you'll want to save like two or three, or you can't resist when you're cooking and you find one that has, um, cause usually, oh, sorry, let me go back a little bit. Usually in a cucumber, um, the riper seeds, the more mature ones will be towards the bottom and the immature ones are more towards the top. Um, but this one is more mature, so pretty ha it has a lot of mature seeds throughout. But anyway, sometimes when I'm cutting a cucumber and I find a few mature cucumber uh, seeds in the bottom, I can't help but try to save them because I have a problem. And then again, I end up with a problem of having to stack all my vessels and not labeling them and then I forget. Um, so then I just feed it to the chickens or go to compost. Um, but yeah, you get plenty, plenty, plenty of seeds from a cucumber. Uh, and I have one, I'm not going to cut up right now. I just harvested this one. I found by accident. It was hiding yesterday. Uh, I think it's a little bit more mature, um, but uh, it should have 
I mean, it's it's still tender, but it's more mature than I should have plucked up. Maybe three, I plucked it from maybe four days late, um, but there should be some seeds in here that are mature, but it's just going to be a little harder to um, sieve through them and find, you know, and toss out the ones that are not mature. The non-mature seeds definitely will not germinate at all. They will just rot out in your soil when you try to um, germinate them. So I, I mentioned about fermenting tomatoes. Again, it's the same thing. Um, they have the little, they have even more of that little jelly like protection coating around it. Um, and you would, you have to, you, you don't have to, but it's easier to just ferment them to have a cleaner seed. Um, the seed, the, the jelly stuff basically just protects them as they're going through the stomachs of animals that eat them. And then so when they poop them out, um, because it, it protects the seeds from getting damaged. And then as the things break, the little jelly stuff breaks down, I forget the name of it, sorry. Um, and they poop out, then that's how they, um, let the seeds get passed around, but without getting damaged in the stomachs of the animals that eat them. We have a couple of questions, and um, okay. Jessica asked, how do you keep cucumbers from cross-pollinating if you have more than one variety in your garden? Keep them as far as away as possible. Um, and cucumber is, and that's a really good question. So I mentioned the, the peppers are um, not as easy to cross pollinate because they uh, self pollinate. The flower will have both male and female parts, but squashes and cucurbits um, and your melon seeds have male and female flowers and they require cross pollination for fruiting. The fruits should be the same when you cross pollinate it, but the seeds will not. So they become hybridized seeds. So you need to make sure that you are growing them far away from each other or just sticks to, if you really want two types, stick to only two types if you have a small yard and put maybe a one type in the front and one type in the back. And also you could, let's say if you wanna grow four and you have a small space. So start out this, and there's many ways, but this is what I would do. One in the front, one in the back. And then when the season's kind of wrapping up a little bit for that particular plant or it's showing less fruit, then um, put down the other two types. That way it's kind of like a succession sowing and then you're, you're, not, you're making sure that they don't all flower at the same time. So even while they're growing, so then now after you do that, you'll have two in the front and two in the back. And the first one is probably on its way out. So you wanna make sure that you save the cucumber seeds before the other one that you put out starts flowering and fruiting because then you know that that one is more isolated, right? Um, once they both fruit at the same time, then you have that hybridization and cross-pollination issue. So then this first one in the front yard that, oh, I don't know, my middle finger, but the first one that you put down, it's done pollinating. Um, I mean, sorry, it's on its way out. And then let's say you're, it's pretty much and you pull it. Then that's when you have then the second one out front that you have by itself. And then it's alone by that time by itself towards the end of the season. Then that's when you take it from fruiting to prevent the cross pollination. It's, I mean, it's still a possibility if like a pollinator goes from your front yard to your backyard, but if you really want to have more varieties, I feel like that's the best way to do it to save seeds and minimize the chances of hybridization. Okay, and uh, Deborah asked if you could please repeat, oh, excuse me, if you could please repeat which plants need hand pollination from a, you know, male to female. Okay, your cucumbers? Okay. Uh, all cucurbits, meaning like cucumbers and squashes. This is a Thai king cob squash. Um, watermelons, um, loofahs, winter melons. Those are all um, plants that need hand pollinating or pollination by something, whether it's you or a bee or a butterfly or something. But these require pollination for it to happen. Whereas pepper plants pretty much um, and tomato plants pretty much pollinate themselves. You just, maybe you can help it by walking by and shaking the plant a little bit to loosen up the pollen um, if you really want more prolific fruiting. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, that's, those are, that's it. <laughs> Any Victor, other? Victor asked a while back, uh, how do you know when cucumbers are ready to pick? He says he picks too early or too late. 
And you may have answered this question already, but if we could just review. Um, when you're picking cucumbers for eating, uh, I kind of eyeball it to when it's about the right size. And then just when the bottom flower is looking like it might fall off and you pick it for eating. Um, once it's fallen off, this is what my dad taught me. Once it's fallen off, it's a little too mature um, and it'll have the seeds. So, but it doesn't matter as much with cucumbers because it's still tasty anyway and it's easier to scoop out the seeds. Um, and I still eat them. Sometimes if my cucumbers have mature seeds, it may just not be as tasty. Um, but for plants like loofahs um, and your bottle gourds or opal gourds, where the tenderness does matter, you definitely want to make sure you pick them before the blossom drops because the meat, the flesh of those types can get very fibrous and not appetizing. But for cucumbers, the, the issue is the annoyance of the seed. Um, and then if you really wait too long where this one's actually a little squishy and spongy, the texture's not gonna be as good. Um, so it has, a ten, it has less of a tendency to taste bad when it's slightly overripe than loofahs and um, gourds. Excellent, thank you. Any other questions? Would the uh, would the flower rule apply to um, things like zucchinis as well? Yes, they belong in the curcubit family. Yes. Okay. The, hand, the pollination, the necessary for the necessity for pollination. So if you're growing a patty plant and some like Italian zucchini, and you want to save those seeds, you want to grow them in different spots or succession so and make sure you're plucking them at a time when only those plants exist. I was actually referring to in terms of harvesting. Oh, um, I think so. I don't grow eggplant because I, uh, not uh, eggplant, I don't grow zucchini because I hate zucchini. But it's, it's kind of uh, the same similar, uh, yeah. And zucchini is usually cooked, so it doesn't, I, th I think texture wise, you know, if you put, if it's more mature you can, and you pull it too late, you can put it in a stew. Um, so it's not, or a ratatouille, and it's not as unpleasant as if you're trying to eat a slightly fresher, like zucchini noodles or um, fresher application. But yeah, I'm the wrong person to really ask a lot about zucchinis. <laughs> <laughs> okay then. Um, we have a little bit of time. I can tell you about eggplants. Yeah. Um, since we were talking about nightshades, this is a Kamo eggplant. It's a Japanese eggplant that's really round. This is another one. This one's over mature, so you can see it turned yellow. So we know this one has good seeds in it. Um, I'm going to cut it up. Big. So that's the inside of a Kamo eggplant. And these don't have that jelly coating on it like uh, tomatoes and peppers, no, sorry, and uh, cucumbers. So what I do, eggplants are a little futzier and harder to take out. I just use my fingernail or I use um, a knife and I just kind of dig it out and scrape it out. And, some, and then you can break it and then you see the inside. So I try not to cut too much because then a lot of times when you cut, you can slice the seeds and then you get this nugget. Some people I think ferment it, but I just go through the trouble of um, picking out all the seeds and then rinsing them out and then letting them dry. And you also want, just like the pepper seeds, you want them, this is really hard to see, you want them a little fatter. That means they are mature and viable. The all of the seeds in this yellow one I can see are viable and mature. So, let me, this one is uh, more tender, but let's just cut it open and see. I don't know what the condition is. It's, I probably also left it a little too long. It was hidden by a big leaf. Ah, okay. So there's seeds all over here. The ones in the middle are more mature than the ones out here. And again, I, I look for fatness. And this would be a slightly less pleasant eggplant to eat because it has more seeds because I did leave it slightly longer, just not as long as this one that's yellowed. Um, let me try to break it open. But you can see though, 
this one has less of uh, a nugget of, I don't know what the official term is, but has less of a nugget than this one. That's because it's this one's less mature. Um, and this one does have, this one does have some immature seeds in here. And it's, oh, here's another way you can tell this, the pulpy, this center part is harder to remove on a less mature eggplant than a mature eggplant. So that's the difference. And you can see the seeds on this smaller one is also bigger than this uh, more uh, tender one. So yeah, that's just how you do the eggplants. And you just do the same thing as peppers, put it in a dish, label it, let it dry and then put it in an envelope or whatever um, vessel you want to hold your seeds and save them in. Just don't mix them up. And I'll also, eggplants, I would grow them in different areas just to minimize the cross-pollination um, of eggplants for those of you who prefer eggplants. Okay, um, quite a question on the eggplants. Are they not like um, tomatoes or peppers in, in that they're self-pollinating? I have to look that up. I think they and are part of the nightshade family. Yeah, I think they're self-pollinating. Um, I don't ever pollinate my eggplants, so but I, I I can confirm that. I don't know that off the top of my head, um, but I believe they are self-pollinating, like peppers and tomatoes. Okay, cool. Um, uh, hang on one second. Eleanor wants to know what kind of meals do you prepare with the peppers you profile? Um, I'll just like add them to anything like a little stir fry or I save them all and I make fermented hot sauce and I love doing that. That's why I grow so many peppers because they really impart different flavors and each year I get different flavor sauces. So um, like the sweeter ones, um, Mirasaki adds like that real strong peppery flavor without the heat. So then I can add something with more heat, like the, the ahis, those have more fruity flavors and those like really blend together. And then you have your more smokier peppers like the Chihuacle Negro or the Ethiopian Berbers. Um, those or your cayenne taps are just spicy. Um, so yeah, that's what I do. Um, and a lot of times I will dry them in a big old jar um, if I, I just leave them all on my counter, especially if the small ones are easy to dry. And then I just throw them in the jar at the end of the season. And if I want pepper powder, I just put it in a spice grinder or my Cuisinart and I have pepper powder. So I don't have to buy any. And you just use it like a regular, you know, pepper flakes or um, like cayenne pepper powder in your food. Excellent. Victor has a comment. He says he loves hearing the chickens in the background. I agree. <laughs> I close all the windows so they wouldn't be so loud. They can be really, really loud sometimes. <laughs> Are they sneaking on the patio? Um, I have a few patios right now. That's, that one that just crowed is on the patio. Uh, okay. Uh, Greg says he has some red amaranth volunteer up this year. And how does he separate the chafe and the seeds? Um. I take the amaranth, I grow a lot of amaranth and um, I let it volunteer and I also sow different types. Um, you save the heads, right? And I throw them in a pillowcase Ooh. and beat out your frustrations. Um, and then you can pour it out and remove, you know, the just chafe and the, um, the bits once it's dried. And also the, I also use old pillowcases to dry these because the amaranth flower heads are huge, right? And, um, and the seeds are tiny, so they go everywhere. If anyone's tried on safe seeds from amaranth or quinoa or any of those small grains, the minute you cut it and bring it in, there's seeds all over the house. Um, so I just stuff it in a pillowcase because again, there's airflow because it's a woven fabric. Don't do a plastic bag. And I just kind of hang it somewhere or just throw it in a corner and every once in a while turn it. And then when it's done, you shake it, um, take it all the big piece bits and then like, uh, this is a tomato bowl, but um, I put it in a deeper bowl like this and you blow. If you don't have like one of those uh, seed things, you just blow the top and the and then shake it like this and blow and then the, the chafe will go out and you have the seeds. And you can use the seeds for, you can actually grind the seeds into flour and make different things like protein bars or cook with it um, like other grains. Um, it's actually pretty delicious. All parts of the amaranth and goose foot family, like your shards, um, quinoa's amaranth, they're all related and they're all edible from the leaves to the seeds 
the flowers, the flowers just aren't as tasty, but yeah. So that's how you do it. Yeah, and did you know you can also uh, pop amaranth seeds? You can what? Pop them. Oh, pop, yes, yes. Um, just like sorghum, if you grow sorghum, you can pop sorghum, popcorn, pop rice. Yeah, most grains and seeds you can pop. Ah, that I did not realize. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In South America, they have this um, kind of like an, a seed and nut cake that has amaranth in it. And some of them have popped amaranth and they do that in Asia, some parts of Asia too. Yeah, in, in Central America, it's the day of the dead thing. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, that's what they make the cakes for, honey cakes. Um, does anybody else have any questions? We are getting toward the end of the hour. I'm going once. <laughs> <laughs> Jessica, would you like to take over here? Yeah, sure. Um, thank you so much. And I learned so much. I love when people just kind of talk from their experience. Um, I don't know, there's just all these tidbits and I don't know, it's just a lot, a lot of tips and things I hadn't thought about before. So thank you. I hope I'm guessing that everyone here got a lot out of your presentation. Um, I'm going to put your, uh, I'm just right now I'm dropping her website and Instagram handle in the chat. So if you want to connect with her or follow her, you can do that. Um, check out her book. When we send up a follow up, follow up email, we will, um, put all that information in the email as well. Um, how you can get to her website, the title of her book, et cetera. Um, so thank you again, everybody for coming. Um, next month, we're still determining <laughs> what our topic is going to be. Um, in October, I, we have um, composting and soil health coming up. Um, so just keep your eye out uh, for our emails for, and Instagram for the next uh, information. I'll put all of our seed library contact info in the chat one more time as well. Um, and again, thank you so much, Anne, for coming and spending an hour with us um, with your expertise. Thanks for having me. And yeah, as Jessica said, you can reach me through um, those things that she put up. Um, and if y'all need help in your garden with chickens or not, give me a ring or a message and I can come out and do some consulting if you need to. So. Excellent. Oh, oh, one more thing. I'm doing, I'm hosting a seed swap. Um, at the end of the month, I, every year I do two seed swaps a year. Um, it's an in-person seed swap this year. Last year we did a little COVID thing. Um, but it's in a park, a public park in La Habra. Um, there is information in my feed about the seed swap. It's open to everybody, no matter what level of gardening. You can even come empty handed if you don't have any seeds. And all of the whole intent that I want to do is to create community and have local people, you know, know each other a little bit. And then we talk gardening, we nerd out about gardening seeds. Some of us bring our like four, you know, cases of seeds. <laughs> and stuff. And then we also trade cuttings um, and even gardening related, you're welcome to trade and barter for um, with other folks. So that's on October 28th at, I think I said four o'clock. No, yeah, four o'clock. And if you send me the detail or I can look on your website, I can include those in the email as well, our follow-up email. Okay, thank you. Right, thank you.